Jamie Campbell, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for the warm welcomes the last couple of days here at Coastal. It's been great to have you here at Coastal. It's been and, wonderful I mean, being this here. This is a double dose for me because you already gave us a wonderful presentation <laughs> all about leaky gut mm-hmm. and IBS this morning to mm-hmm. the team or this afternoon for the team. And I get you here again on the podcast to basically dig into that a little bit more. Yeah, let's do it. Could you tell me a little bit more about yourself, Jamie? Yeah, um, professionally or anything. You just free reign. Sure. Okay. So uh, currently living in the San Francisco Bay Area with my husband and three dogs, Billy, Bean, and Loki. My husband's name is Chris. Of course, he comes last. Last. <laughs> <laughs> um, professionally, I'm a licensed dietitian nutritionist, um, master's in clinical nutrition and functional medicine. Uh, like I said, we live uh, about 20 minutes north of Golden Gate Bridge. My husband and I own a integrative training and wellness center called Vitality Code. Um, where we provide different modalities by way of hormesis. So there's the physical training aspect, there's uh, red light therapy, we're going to have a cold plunge. And then for the integrated part, I do practice my clinical nutrition out of an office there. So to serve people within my locale, but also remotely as well. What, what got you into this in the first place? Nutrition. Yeah. Yeah, so... In undergrad, it was kind of like a crossroads point in my life where I was declared a marine biology major, was doing some work work experience for that um, out at a marine lab where I live, finding myself out there at 2 to 3 a.m. in the morning doing lab work. And I was just like, is this what I find myself doing the rest of my life? And the answer was a resounding no. Um, And at the time, I was kind of going through some... I'd say changes in my patterns towards food that weren't the most healthy. Um, What ended up happening is that I actually became anorexic, although not clinically diagnosed. Um, But, you know, it did kind of propel me into learning more about nutrition, albeit probably not the most healthfully. Um, And so I was at crossroads being like, I don't want to do this, but this is obviously piquing my interest. And that's what drove me into changing my major into dietetics. And ever since then, I've just been kind of work experience by work experience and added education, uh, just going down that path to see where it takes me. Can I, I'm interested to hear Mm. with your journey with with anorexia, Mm. which you're saying at the time wasn't actually diagnosed. Mm -hmm. What about that phase of your life Mm. stemmed this interest in nutrition? Was it that you were, did you realize that something was maybe not right and you needed to do something about it? Was it? Yeah. Yeah, please. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, It was more the first time that I started realizing a correlation between what I ate and the impact that it has on my body. Um, You know, through high school, I was a very active uh, teenager, always was in some sort of competitive sport, um, competitive team sport. This was in Asia, in the Philippines, moved to California, had no intention of playing collegiate just because it didn't really make sense to pay international tuition fees for you know units of soccer when I should be doing something that's more directed towards a degree that I'm trying to gain and so became very sedentary when I moved to the states and then uninhibited food consumption because you know I didn't have to think about it through high school Um, that then pivoted me into anorexia because I saw kind of like the progressive changes on the body and didn't know how else to correct it if you will and kind of co- overcorrected. Um, when I said not clinically diagnosed is like I never saw a practitioner but when you step on the scale and you see 98 pounds you know when you're 20 that's a pretty big sign um, and then I would say got into I got into physique competitions after that um, Again, not the most healthy of ways to go about food, but it did, you know, help me learn more about nutrition and gain some sort of routine around that as well. Um, So I'd say like it's just been like moments in my timeline that has gotten me from a place of not the best relationship or routine around food to where I'm at now. But I'd say it's been a progressive learning experience that's personal and when it comes to professional working in situations where again learning what I don't like and what I don't want and how I show up for other people 
uh, what I mean by that is uh, one of I one of the things I did professionally was to run a breakfast and lunch school like the school breakfast and lunch program for a couple local school districts the title was child nutrition services and same thing like morale morally cannot say that I back you know tomato sauce on frozen pizza as a serving of vegetables so learned very quickly like not what I want to do not who I want to be then moved into working for a um, medically supervised weight loss clinic same thing you know through experience learning how I don't want to show up for others I don't want to be putting people on 900 calories and tempering that discomfort with medications and saying that that's okay and so then went to clinical practice on my own because through those experiences learned how I want to be as a practitioner how I want to support individuals what my beliefs are when it comes to uh health and wellness as like an integrative and holistic approach. I love that. It sounds like you've had these, these experiences and these opportunities, which have pushed you towards knowing who mm-hmm. you want to be and also running yeah. away from probably who you don't want to be and what, totally. you, don't, what yeah. you don't want to do. Yeah. I would say like, if anything, the learning experience has become more and more refined by understanding what I do not want. Mm. Mm-hmm. So if you were to talk about your practice now, Mm. you know, like you've got this opportunity, you've created your own business, you're serving people in the way that like Jamie wants to serve Mm -hmm. them. What does that look like? Mm. So, I mean, I think there's a couple things, a couple filters, if you will. Um, The first is the holistic, integrative clinical approach when it comes to how I support individuals, like understanding that the body is not, is a sum of its parts and not just any one thing that you focus on. And then there's just me as an individual in terms of how I show up. You know, I'd say I'm a very like no bullshit type of individual. Um, and I say it as it is. And some people love that and some people don't really like that personality. And so I'd say the two things together is what makes my practice unique because people understand, okay, I'm getting this holistic approach, but I'm also getting a person that's not going to let me, you know, continuously make excuses. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does for sure. I want to go, I want to, I want to turn this into probably the conversation that's going to steer a lot of this podcast, which Mm. was around the idea of leaky gut. Mm. So context, the story Mm. is we knew you were coming into town. Mm -hmm. Those who don't know, by the way, listeners, Jamie is Isabel's sister, Isabel, who's the general manager here at Ghost and Process. Um, have been following you on, on social media and mm. seeing your journey, hearing amazing things about what you're doing through Izzy and knew that you'd be here. So let's mm. get inside your head and learn more about what it is you're doing in the, in the hope that it's going to help us level up as coaches mm-hmm. as well. So we basically said to you, Jamie, could you, would you be up for putting on a professional development session for the coaches and our affiliates? Mm. And you chose a topic of mm. leaky gut mm-hmm. and we went pretty deep into you know, understanding more about it, symptoms, um, diagnosing protocols to, to help fix it. Mm. I want to ask you to start, why did you pick leaky gut? Yeah. Um, I would say the biggest reason I was picking it is because I was like, what can I do that's relevant to the individuals I'm speaking with here at Coastal and what will cast the widest net so that it would again be relevant to some degree to almost everyone that's sitting in the room. Um, the reason of being or doing that rather than speaking to any one specific gut condition, you know, as, of which I can in great detail is that I don't want to lose half the half the crowd because they they're like, that doesn't Lots relate to me. to me. And also wanting to understand or trying to provide value in the sense of like, what can you all at Coastal then maybe take to your clients? You know, they come in voice to something about their gut condition or a reaction that they're experiencing what can you provide value or what can you do to provide value to them as well so considering that as well when i built the built the whole presentation yeah i mean like listen listen to your presentation and i and i've shared with you some of like my story in the past as well Mm -hmm. where like symptoms of leaky gut have definitely been prevalent in my life up until this point and for sure like still there'll be bouts and periods of time where like my digestive system definitely isn't functioning mm-hmm. that well. And I've been lucky to, you know, work with functional diagnostic people in the medicine space, mm-hmm. uh, get lots of testing done just through my own Curiosity. interest because yep. I was realizing that things weren't right with me. Yep. And I, I felt like I, within the knowledge that I had at the time had done everything to try and fix it and it wasn't working. Mm-hmm. 
Um, so very relatable mm-hmm. listening to what you're talking about. But like you said, it it pretty much I would say that leaky gut in some way, shape, or form is affecting like all of us. Yeah, at I, some point, so absolutely, it, it is a super wide net that you're casting. And I think maybe we need to start by talking about what what do we mean by leaky gut. Yeah, what is it specifically? So what leaky, well, maybe I'll just back up a couple steps and state that leaky gut happens at the level of the small intestines. Our small intestine is semi-permeable, meaning that it does allow some flux, ideally only in one direction if healthy. Um, And it's not just like a brick barrier. It is also where we do a lot of our exchange between our internal environment and our external world. Leaky gut is when that barrier becomes hyperpermeable. So scientifically known as intestinal hyperpermeability. I'd say leaky gut is more of like the layman's term, if you will. Um, So it happens at the level of small intestines. It's essentially the degradation of that barrier, which then allows more than what should be passing through, pass through. Um, from the gut into our bloodstream, which then subsequently leads to all of these other concerns. Um, And just to voice what you had mentioned in terms of like the casting of the wide net, I would say what I oftentimes tell people is like, if we're not proactively supporting our gut, you are to one degree or another suffering from leaky gut because there's so many environmental things that are working to degrade it just in terms of modern day society and modern day living. Love it. I want to try and put this into simple terms. Sure. <clears throat> so, because I, I think you use an analogy in our talk, which was self versus non-self, mm. which I, I think I understand, but mm-hmm. I'm going to try now. So what, what you're saying is that the, in, at the small intestines, the things that are entering our body, typically that's at the point when it gets the small intestines and it's got to do, it's got to go through quite a bit to get there. Mm. Right. But when it gets there, that's where most of the passing from it being an exogenous or an outside source then becomes a part of the body, Mm. right? So it passes through the cell walls Mm -hmm. of the internal, of the small intestines, Mm -hmm. and then it becomes, it moves into bloodstream and then it's now a part of us, Mm -hmm. right? Is that what we're saying? That's correct. So like the things that are supposed to be passing through at the level of small intestines should have been treated and metabolized into self related molecules if you will when we consume food no food is considered self because it's all external to us so the digestive process means that it has to be treated metabolized metabolized digested and then absorbed at the level of the small intestines in its molecular constituents or its molecular parts if you will as i mentioned in the presentation you can't eat a piece of chicken and it just automatically gets slurped up by our own musculature it has to be degraded into its molecular parts and then regenerate it into our muscles and so at the level of the of the gut leaky gut happens when the undigested food particles or it could be toxins that happen through our agricultural process it could be toxins created internally because we do create our own level of toxicity if there's leaky gut this stuff is passing through into the bloodstream and are considered non-self subjects if you will can you just quickly give us a one-on-one on toxins so when Mm. so external toxins from Mm. the environment let's say something like pesticides yep and then what are these internal toxins the toxins of the process of metabolism, you know, every time any of our pathways function, we do emit a level of toxins, which is why we have a robust detoxification process. It's not just things coming from our external world, but we also internally produce them too as a byproduct of metabolic processes. Our gut houses many, many gut bugs, and they too create their own little byproduct of toxins too that we have to eliminate out. Um, you know, I touched on this very briefly, but, uh, and not to get too in the weeds of things, but small intestinal bacterial overgrowth can release toxins in the small intestines. And if you have leaky gut, that leads to the passage of endotoxins into our bloodstream, considered non-self. So the toxins that are entering our body or are being produced within our body, which are not necessarily a bad thing. Mm. It's only what we're saying. It's only a bad thing if our body cannot detoxify those toxins. Correct. And therefore then they're passing through our gut wall and actually entering our system. Mm -hmm. So am I correct in understanding that the toxins, should our body be able to detoxify them? 
toxins are released through bowels, mm. right? So bowel movements, urine and sweat, stool, sweat and mm-hmm. sweat, right? Breath as well? Uh, that yes. I would not say so, okay. no. Yeah, cool. so sweat, urine, um, bowels, feces for women, you know, our monthly menstrual cycle is also mm. a big detox process as well. And so if if our gut lining, if mm. our in- small intestines are doing their job, mm then we're going to minimize or reduce the likelihood of things like toxins passing through the Mm -hmm. gut wall and actually entering our bloodstream. If your, if your gut lining is healthy, it would prevent the passage of toxins into your bloodstream. Is that what you're asking? Yes. That is correct. Yes. Yes. But also too, like if just on the, on the process of detoxification, like if the burden or the load is greater than our detox capabilities, Mm -hmm. it's got to go somewhere, you know, and oftentimes, and this is going back to bowels. This is the reason why constipation is a huge issue. You know, people are like, Oh, I've only, I've always been constipated. I'm like, that's not normal. And that's also impacting your ability to properly process out the toxins that your body is naturally either accumulating or is coming in from the external world um and so constipation is one avenue of increasing your total body burden of toxin load okay on that note then Mm. i think we should talk about symptoms of leaky gut so people listening to this being like okay it kind of makes sense Mm. do i have it i think that's a question that probably people are asking now yeah so what are some of the telltale signs that you might have something that's worth exploring yeah, and that's a great question is because there's the obvious bowel-related concerns, like the obvious symptomologies that come about experience on a day-to-day basis when it comes to bloat, constipation, diarrhea, inexplicable food intolerances or a, gl- a growing list of food intolerances. You know, I used to be able to eat this and now I can't seem to eat it without feeling a little off. Mm. Um, then there's the list of completely or seemingly unrelated symptoms when it comes to other chronic disease states. Like there's a lot of correlation between the growing, uh, the growing, I'm losing my words, Hmm. the growing like prevalence, sorry, of autoimmune conditions, completely not related to gut symptoms, if you will, but a big, big driver of the, potentiation of of autoimmunity uh atopic skin like skin conditions Mm -hmm. asthma is also a growing thing as well very much correlated to leaky gut too so that's the reason why i'm saying it's like it's pretty ubiquitous or prevalent to everyone and oftentimes people are like my gut's fine i'm like well what do you have all these other things Mm -hmm. that you wouldn't make a correlation they say yes i'm like then it's probably tethered to your gut so i mean a lot of people will use things like their stools so Mm. looking at the toilet after they've been to the toilet Mm. as basically their marker as to how healthy their gut is but what are you saying that is it possible for someone to be showcasing all these other symptoms Mm. and actually still have stools that look quote unquote healthy yep no 100 percent. yes so okay before i share some stories i'm now remembering even more stories about yeah. my own leaky gut issues for like forever yeah um like what is the issue here like why why is mm. this something we need to be concerned about you yeah. know if you're if you're listening to those symptoms and you're saying okay yeah you're ticking a few boxes like oh, i got a bit of that but got why a bit should of that. i care why should i care like yeah because i'm going to put this into the context of most of our listeners mm. they might be experiencing these things and they're like I'm still training five days a week. I might be training twice a day. Mm -hmm. Like I'm getting stronger. Mm -hmm. I look good naked. Mm -hmm. Like what's the issue? Totally. Yeah. Why do I need to care about leaky gut? This might not even be prevalent to me. Mm -hmm. Um, The reason why leaky gut specifically matters or why it's important is because once that barrier starts breaking down, if not now, it's just a matter of when that will catch up to you. Like I mentioned, the gut is where we do most of our exchange between the external world and the internal environment. And so if things that are considered non-self are constantly entering into your bloodstream, again, those being undigested food particles, toxins, endotoxins, what that ends up doing is triggering your immune response or body does kickstart your immune, your immune system to start combating these non-self molecules coming in then what happens is that then there's a chronic state of 
immune response and inflammation in the body. You know, once that barrier has holes the size of, you know, Swiss cheese in it, everything's floating through, immune systems constantly activated, and that leads to the deterioration of your overall health and the onset of other chronic disease states. So like, let's use autoimmunity for an example and its growing prevalence. Autoimmunity is a condition when your immune system attacks yourself. And so let me give an example. Um, Type 1 diabetes is a self-attack of the pancreas. Uh, Hashimoto is a self-attack of your thyroid. When your body is already at a heightened state of immune response, it's just a matter of time before it starts turning to its own cells, its own tissues, its own organs. Um, and starts attacking it. Same thing when it comes to asthma. That's a very common thing that people struggle with nowadays. Also a byproduct of a heightened immune response. You know, then you come in with an allergen, say summertime, the blossoms come in, your immune system is already so heightened. It's just a matter of time that something coming in as an external allergen just triggers that off again. You know, and so you want to temper that inflammation. And that's where leaky gut matters is because if that's happening, then that means inflammation is constantly high. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I always think about it, maybe even put it in like even simpler terms when mm-hmm. I think about it is if your body is having to allocate all these resources mm-hmm. to deal with what's happening as a result of a gut that's not doing its job, yep. you just ultimately have less resources for everything else. Yes. And I always kind of, use that analogy for people who can't understand why this might be something mm-hmm. that's that's an issue but you know putting it back into the language of what maybe what their priorities are which yep. is like okay i want to build muscle right well like you know you understand you're, you're minimum you're, you're reducing your body's ability to recover and actually rebuild tissue yeah you know if your body is having to put all this energy and time towards actually trying to you know fight, fight off fight off the things that are coming through mm-hmm. that digestive system mm-hmm. then you can replace build muscle with anything Mm -hmm. right because at the end of the day we still have finite resources every day to allocate to things that are important to us Mm -hmm. no that's absolutely right and that's a great great way to sum it up also too it's like muscle building is one thing that you mentioned um but also supporting your immune system you know if you're constantly triggering that immune system then you become very immunocompromised and again you might be doing just fine now but it's only a matter of time when you start running on reserves you know our body can't be functioning at that capacity all the time, especially for uh, elite high level athletes. That is, we're asking a lot of the body to be functioning when things are not firing on all four four cylinders. So this whole idea of like your immune system, Mm -hmm. your immunity is is like determined by your gut or you said Mm -hmm. 70% of our immunity is Is actually in the gut. gut. Can you just explain that Mm -hmm. concept? Because Mm -hmm. I've always been told it, but not until I started diving into books Mm -hmm. and trying to understand it, that it started making sense. Yeah. So what that means is that a vast majority of your immune cells are located in your gut rather than free floating um, systemically. And the reason for that is exactly what I'm saying is that they're little soldiers kind of at the ready for when something crosses that's not meant to be. Um, And this is our own natural protective mechanism, but there's only so much that you can berate it with before things start crumbling. And so 70% of your immune system being in your gut is for that very reason, is to make sure that if healthy, what few is coming through is able to be taken care of immediately. Um, Because like I mentioned, that's, that's where we do a lot of our exchange between external and internal. Where's the other 30%? 30% of the immune system? Yeah. Free floating in the body. Okay, cool. So mm-hmm. they're just a few little soldiers and small little mm-hmm. groups who mm-hmm. are just ready to fight off. Yep. Something. So I'm thinking about my own story. Oh. And actually kind of, it makes me laugh thinking about mm. this. But so I didn't, I didn't realize that I was lactose intolerant mm. until... I got to university. Mm. So like basically like late teens, early twenties. Yeah. Uh, and that was only because <clears throat> I just had this idea that I couldn't wait to get to England for uni because the milk was really nice. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I started buying lots of milk mm-hmm. and I was, it was, you know, flying through me, mm-hmm. you know, within minutes, my mm-hmm. stomach would feel like a washing machine. But the stupid thing is, is I would honestly say from the age of seven till 16, mm. I had Oreos and milk for dinner <laughs> as my dessert. 
yeah. or like a, a silly amount of like dryers or Hagen Dazs ice cream. Uh-huh. And I would have the shits every single time. <laughs> I, I kid you not, because it was like cool. It was like cool to have Oreos dipped in milk, right? So right. I would just do it. Right. And I would have the shits uh-huh. guaranteed. And I and I honestly think this this was like ninety percent of my childhood. Yeah. Having and the shits. Just having the shits. And never <laughs> ever thinking there was anything wrong with it. Right. Like this is normal. Everyone's Yeah, you know, genuinely. I just thought everyone was just, <laughs> you know, weeing out their bum. Yeah. I didn't think it was a bad thing. And it's like I I look back on that now mm. and I actually didn't get sick very often, but mm. I've had a lot of injuries. Mm. Like a lot of injuries in my professional career even before my professional career Mm. even post um and i'm always always reflecting back on like early early life years to be like why why did it all why did i have so many issues Mm. and nutrition is kind of like this one area that probably only in the last few years i've really started to think back to what i used to eat as a kid and by the way like my parents listen to this podcast i know dig at my parents at all mm-hmm. back then mm-hmm. like it wasn't conversations yeah absolutely. didn't know how bad yeah. canned drinks were yep. and it wasn't even their fault like mm-hmm. if they told me not to drink it, i'd fucking drink it anyway yep. so you know like <laughs> two or three cans of like yeah. coca-cola or like iced tea every day chocolates sweets oreos and milk ice cream like my digestive system was just a mess genuinely for like 15 20 years and i wonder mm. you know the impact that that had then into later life yeah and if that was a big contributor to mm-hmm. why I had so many injuries, why I felt like I recovered really badly, mm. um, why I had like skin issues. Like yeah. I never had, it wasn't acne, but I definitely would get like flare ups of small parts like psoriasis or mm. just like itchy skin. Mm-hmm. I would get these like blemishes that were, were like, um, I guess it's like just a histamine reaction, mm-hmm. right? Where it mm-hmm. looks like a mosquito bite. Yeah. And then everyone would be like, oh, you got a mosquito bite behind your ear. And I'm like, there's no this is middle of winter like, there's no mosquitoes yeah. but for years i've been like yeah mosquito always bites me in that exact place but now i'm like that's so silly <laughs> so it's kind of like i don't even know where i'm going with this yeah. but it's yeah yeah the, you know it's connecting the dots like i'm mm-hmm. sure that had an impact mm-hmm. on me mm-hmm. it does 100 when i work with clients i do a thorough health history asking what was food like when you were a kid uh, has there been a huge history of antibiotic use? What about over-the-counter medications? Because yes, it's what within your health timeline is causing you to present as you are in health now as an adult. And yeah, 100%. Oftentimes I'll talk to clients and they can maybe pinpoint to one specific turning point in their life that they're like, yep, that was the reason or that was a thing that caused the the tipping of the scales when it comes to all of these health conditions and gut symptoms to start presenting. Um, But yes, I mean, you know, digestive health starts even preconception, you know, depends on what your mom's microbiome is, depends on if you were breastfed, depends on if you were C-section or vaginal birth. That's all very, or obviously uncontrollable factors. Um, but, But the diet and the lifestyle has a huge, huge is a huge driver to what things will look like when you're an adult yeah and it's like even even now if i do get sick which isn't very often Mm. but when i do get sick there's almost always a positive correlation in the functionality of my gut at that point in time and that's not i'm not getting blood tests done but i'm just you know just a quick analysis of my stools Mm -hmm. and being like okay that doesn't look look right right, Right. and i've got a cold yep and it's like there's no coincidence right yeah and often the cold or the flu will come at the end of maybe a one week or two week period where my gut is not great Mm -hmm. and i'm feeling fine Mm -hmm. and then suddenly you get sick and you're like Mm -hmm. ah okay there there were my the signs were almost always there yeah and i guess the more and more i become aware of this Mm -hmm. the more i'm able to now you know catch it early yeah because it's a thing right you can actually your body's amazing at just finding a way to get you through life mm-hmm. you know the sympathetic system mm-hmm. drives up and it's like well ed you got some hard shit to do this week we're gonna get you through that right and everything's a bit numb mm-hmm. you feel fine and then but now you know using something like my stools mm-hmm. and just the general feeling of how my mm-hmm. gut feels like it's functioning mm-hmm. and i feel like i've almost developed a, a much better connection with mm-hmm. that and i actually like listen to it now so yeah. if i have a couple of days where i might not feeling great mm-hmm. i'll like step up my game and picking cleaner choices yep um you know 
being more diligent with my chewing, mm-hmm. hydrating a little bit more, mm-hmm. stepping up on my, my lifestyle facts is just because I'm like, okay, I think I need to yeah. step up in this area. Yeah, no, that's great. Those are all wonderful things. And it's interesting to say like the, the seeming deterioration, the gut that was viewed as like changes in your bowel movements followed or preceded a respiratory related thing that mm-hmm. came on. So again, like a very large correlation between gut health and general health and f- body bodily functions let's talk about training in the gut then training what, what impact you know for, for a lot of people listening to this podcast they are working out they're working out yeah. but they're also probably leaning towards hard working out mm. um so maybe people who are doing hit training at some point mm. in time maybe they're competitive athletes yep. um in any sports discipline mm-hmm. um what are the impacts and why what are the impacts of heavy bouts of training on gut health? Yeah. So I had mentioned in the presentation exercise is self-induced stress. Um, we do it for the long-term benefits of becoming more resilient individuals. However, when we are doing it at a level of, you know, an elite athlete, it does place a degree of stress on the body that's not I would say, for lack of a better word, maybe not natural for the body to kind of cope with or deal with or the ability to recuperate from. And so I would say when it comes to gut health for high level athletes, the intention and proactiveness to supporting this organ system is even greater or more important. Um, It's been shown you know, heavy bouts of exercise, even within what would be considered more reasonable quantities does cause a level of deterioration to your gut lining and so you you know 2x 3x that for a high level crossfit athlete um you can kind of imagine what that would do to you so i would say if the question is like what can you do proactively to combat that i guess i even have another question that's Mm. coming up now which is almost catch 22 when you have athletes who are competing in such energy demanding sports yeah. like CrossFit where mm. caloric intake has to be high yeah. in order to support training twice a day and doing a lot of aerobic training, for example, yeah. which means that sticking to whole foods is really hard because to, to hit that those calorie mm. demands, we clean foods gets tough. So, you know, you hear everyone saying, well, go to like liquid nutrition or, you know, go to mm. processed sugars so you can get the food in quicker or yep. get the car- carbohydrates in faster it's kind of like you've already got a system that is getting smashed through really hard intense exercise which is requiring a lot for exercise Mm -hmm. they're then needing to fuel themselves with less ideal food choices from a gut health perspective right but to to, get in their caloric to be able to just support them to do so it's kind of like you've got two colliding forces not not contributing to health Mm -hmm. you know what are your Mm -hmm. thoughts yeah i mean that is kind of the catch-22 um in that scenario so you kind of do with the tools that you have at your disposal and if it's not necessarily the adjustment to food i mean i do feel i do greatly feel there's always room for adjustment to Mm. food it might not be the overhaul and the perfect scenario in your mind but small improvements or improvements nonetheless um so adjustments to food in terms like, okay, well, how else can we get in more calories that aren't necessarily what would be considered inflammatory calories? Um, and there's also supplemental things that you can do as well. You know, if it's not adjustment through food and deterioration kind of is going to happen just by nature of the beast, then supplementation to provide the gut with the components it needs to regenerate itself through these bouts of training whether it's a season and then when you go off season I don't I can't speak confidently with CrossFit but really taking that time and intention to rebuild the gut before the next bout comes up again Um, and I I would assume that maybe that's not necessarily a a common practice something that we definitely try to advocate Mm. you know our athletes to do Mm -hmm. to utilize the off season where training intensity is going to be lower anyway um you've just come out of a really intense bout of life where Mm. like there's been competition training intensity and volume being higher Mm. we would always say you know try to prioritize try to prioritize good food choices and just just general stepping up of Mm. everything outside of the weight the gym room 
um, and you know just trying to be as healthy as possible knowing that it's a part of sport mm -hmm. is that there is going to be periods every year mm -hmm. you know if you're a high level athlete that could be two to three times in a season mm -hmm. if you're someone who just loves the cross open then maybe it's just once mm -hmm. but that is just a part of it's a part of the parcel of being a high level athlete totally. so you need to accept that that's going to happen at yes. periods and you need to mitigate that as much as possible in these other periods absolutely of the year. yes yes um <laughs> that's absolutely right because i'm from the physique competition bodybuilding world that i was in before it's like it's the exact same thing you do this understanding that it's not the most healthy thing mm. to do you do what you can with the tools that you are given with the goal that you have in place and then when you get off of off season you have to be very intentional and make sure you re-regulate and rebalance I everything mean you don't just daddy bolt you don't just dirty bowl. No. I feel like that could be a whole podcast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not a fan of the dirty bulking. <laughs> Can I ask you, Jamie? Mm. So I haven't seen you eat yet, so I don't know what your lunchbox looks like. Mm. But in the same way that people probably look at coaches and they're like, oh, you must train like three times a day mm. and like go really hard. What I mean, what is what does your food look like? Yeah. You know, are you super clean? I do you eliminate all processed foods. Mm. Um, and, you know, knowing knowing the knowledge behind mm -hmm. you know very deep knowledge behind what you put into your body and what's actually happening internally mm -hmm. what are your current nutritional practices look like yeah i would say that um both my husband and i do greatly emphasize eating whole foods um i would say that is our default pattern is to eat whole non-processed foods we also make sure that we eat non-inflammatory oils meaning non-industrial seed oils that have been shown to be quite deleterious to your health we do try to eat as gluten-free as possible um you know i i cook constantly i um make sure that we have well-balanced breakfast lunches and dinners it doesn't mean to say i'm like a hermit and i don't enjoy food of course i do um we go out you know and we eat out and we will eat with pretty much zero inhibitions if we are choosing to have a nice meal together um and that's the balance that we've kind of striked when it comes to nutrition and maintaining um and that could look diff very different from for everyone you know someone who might have a health condition that they have to be aware of you know that balance might look a little bit different from someone who is a high level athlete you know that's rebalanced everything and can tolerate a little bit more of what would be considered quote unquote inflammatory foods um and so yeah i would say like nutritionists tend to have like this maybe a, a preconception that we just eat, you know, lettuce and whatnot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and albeit I do try to eat as whole and non-processed, it doesn't mean I don't enjoy food as well. Um, I just understand and make the decision uh, like it's an intentional choice, yeah. if that makes sense. I'm very much in the same mm -hmm. in the same boat at the mm -hmm. moment. I've, uh, I've actually talked about this on the podcast a bit, but I don't think in much detail. Mm. Uh, but it was actually at the end of, <clears throat> and actually just listening to you speak has made me reflect on it a little bit more. But the end of not last season, the season before, mm. um, when the quarterfinals finished and I knew that, okay, that's the end of my season. Mm -hmm. I had been dealing with gut issues probably for like two months. Mm -hmm. And it got to a point where I was getting like really gassy at night time, was getting super bloated, um, like appetite signals were all a little bit out. Yeah. And I basically got to a point where I was like, okay, I need to do something about this now. I just thought not training hard was going to fix it. And I also didn't didn't feel the... the uh, the want or the desire to come back to training for about almost two months mm -hmm. after and i didn't even do that much mm -hmm. i did literally three weeks with one workout a week and i did two work two days of like seven workouts within two days and that was it mm -hmm. and i was like ruined yeah um so that was like that led me on my probably the latest quest of like experimentation with mm -hmm. myself mm -hmm. which was i then just looked at what i was eating at that point in time yeah. um definitely not as a, I would say within this team mm. and this team is a very fit looking group of individuals, mm -hmm. but they enjoy their fair share of processed foods. Like there's normally a bag of sweets or gummies, like on this table biscuits, mm -hmm. like these guys like indulge and they, they love it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I realized I was doing a bit of that. Mm -hmm hadn't really fully bought into the importance of food quality. Mm -hmm. So I, if it was like, 
an organic chicken versus cheap China chicken. I just go for the cheap China chicken. Mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. know, I wasn't really thinking about pesticides. I wasn't really thinking about mm-hmm. where things were sourced, where they were farmed. Yeah. I was actually, and I think this is quite funny, and I never actually said this out loud. I was trying to tell myself that I was a high level athlete, mm-hmm. even though I was training five days a week for 60 to 75 minutes a day. Uh-huh. So basically I was saying to myself, oh, because I'm doing a competition, I should be eating cereal before uh-huh. my workouts. Uh-huh. You know, I uh-huh. should be having like Gatorades mid workout. Yeah. And I was like, in, in, in reflection, I was like, you didn't need that shit. Like I only really had to hit 3000 calories a day and that right. was maintenance. Like right. there was no need for me to be doing all this, mm-hmm. but I was seeing all the guys around me mm-hmm. who were training twice a day do it. And I thought, why can't oh, I? Oh, you know, yeah, it's going to, you know, speed up the recovery process, get glycogen to my tissues, blah, right. blah, blah, blah. Right. And so anyway, I then got tested and went on to a low FODMAP diet. So mm-hmm. just a lot of inflammatory markers. Gut wasn't right. So I went low FODMAP and basically just a whole foods diet for three months. Mm-hmm. Saw loads of changes mm-hmm. and just felt better, like in all aspects of yeah. my life. And I kind of just made a decision there. I was like, I'm just going to keep this going. It's yeah. not been hard for me. Yeah. So there were there were the higher FODMAP foods like onions and garlic, which I, which I reintroduced. But mm-hmm. basically I stuck to the whole... I'm not going to have processed food mm-hmm. anymore, even to a point where I don't remove my protein shake mm-hmm. and just mm-hmm. go for whole foods only, which yeah. would be, which was, which was the first time in probably like 16 years that you did not that have, I protein, didn't have a protein shake. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that's the boat that I'm in now. And mm-hmm. like, I feel like I will be on this boat till the day that I die. Mm-hmm. And I'm probably getting more and more into looking at where the food I'm consuming is sourced mm-hmm. um, and where it's coming from. Mm-hmm. And I never thought, I'd be that that guy, mm-hmm. you know, but I guess it's just seeing the impact that it has on the way that I feel and mm-hmm. the way that my body functions. Yeah. I'm now in a position where I'm like, and I can afford it. I think that's a really important thing. Mm-hmm. I'm in a position now where I can actually afford to pay a bit more money for the nice chicken mm-hmm. versus the cheap chicken. Mm-hmm. Cause I think that's a very, we've got to be honest, like for a lot of people that's just out, out of budget. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's where I'm at. Yeah, and I think that's great. And it, just to echo what you mentioned, just organic or non-organic, I think the first level is to ideally shift to a more whole foods mm. way of eating. Um, and yes, I mean, you know, to me, what I tell people is like 200 calories of gummy bears, let's just say, is received by the, the body much differently than, let's say, 200 calories of rice rice or a starchy vegetable that's whole foods Mm -hmm. like you can't tell me that the body is going to process or function as efficiently on 200 calories of gummy bear even though it's fitting in your macronutrients um and also too it's about like the longevity of things as well right like how well do you want to feel when you're 40 50 60 maybe at 20 30 the bowl cereal is not really impacting you all that much but you know, you can't expect to be functioning at the level that you are from a physical standpoint when you're 40, 50, 60. So like make these dietary choices and implement these routines now. Um, I always emphasize that for people that are more our age is it will pay off later rather than your 50, 60 and having to do a huge overhaul in how you view and eat food, you know, instilling it at a younger age will set you up greatly for when we are older love it mm-hmm. okay let's bring this back to the listener who's now listening to this and thinking okay a few of these symptoms definitely apply to me mm-hmm. what do i do about it now mm-hmm. you presented the framework of the five r's yeah which i loved mm-hmm. that was like a lot of light bulb moments going off for me because mm-hmm. it totally makes sense mm-hmm. um i would love you for you to share what the five r's are sure um so first of all the five r protocol was created by the institute of functional medicine um so it wasn't like my my created thing it was through them and what the five r stands for first of all is remove uh replace re-inoculate repair and rebalance that's what the r's stand for and it's essentially a holistic and integrative protocol or approach to move someone through a full gut healing journey um and the goal is to have normalcy in bowel symptoms or any other presented symptoms, even if it's non-associated with bowels, for example, like atopic skin conditions, you know, you want to see the eczema go away um, and never come back. And so it essentially leaves no stone and turn when it comes to addressing the different facets that can be 
impacting gut health and gut function. I'd love to go through each one of those. Sure. Yeah, because you had some, there's some really good takeaway points, I think. So the first one, mm. remove. What do we mean by remove? Yeah, so removing triggering foods. There's oftentimes, you know, the high level foods through research has been shown to be quite inflammatory. Um, those being gluten, dairy, uh, corn, and soy can be often in that list. So again, this is... The data has shown to be quite inflammatory foods and so oftentimes low-hanging fruits to try to nix out or avoid. And then there's also triggering foods for the individual. You know, one person might present a case where they'll eat broccoli and they instantly get bloated. Another person could say, oh, it's, you know, garlic or garlic powder. And so oftentimes people know through experience what those triggering foods are and it would be the removal of those as well and the reason i'm saying this is because when we are triggering inflammation which is presented as a you know experienced gut symptom that is something going awry in the body it's inflammation is heightened and you want to temper that as best as possible to provide space for the body to do itself and the gut specifically it's self-healing and self-cleaning process um, and then it's also removal of any pathogenic overgrowth that's present uh, whether it be SIBO small intestinal bacterial overgrowth CFO fungal overgrowth candida um, which is a yeast slash fungal yeah I've had that mm -hmm, as well so um, if there's overgrowth of pathogens you know that could also lead to gut issues too oftentimes you had mentioned FODMAP right that's very tethered to small intestinal bacterial overgrowth you eat certain foods the bacteria in the small intestines ferments it causing bloat discomfort um, and then if you're eating candida it feeds off of high sugar high carb foods the so same thing you eat something high sugar high carb uh, candida flares up presenting with its associated symptoms as well so remove being removed triggering foods uh, remove um, pathogenic overgrowth um, and with the pathogenic overgrowth oftentimes it's by either symptomology you can kind of pick up from data gathering like it sounds like this or it sounds like that or you can do specific functional medicine testing as well um, and I think I want also want to mention this when it comes to removal of food um, what I tell my clients is the removal of foods, especially ones that are seemingly healthy. So we talk about, you know, broccoli or FODMAP foods. Um, the removal of those is not a lifestyle approach. It's to just lower the barrier that uh, towards healing. Yeah. <clears throat> and actually allow healing to take place by exactly. minimizing the inflammation. Yeah. Right. And then the goal is to ideally through a specified gut healing protocol, build tolerance to the food of which you re-challenge later on. Mm. Um, after everything's said and done. Okay, let's talk about gluten because we mm. t we had an interesting conversation about this. Yeah. And so I think, okay, firstly, mm. gluten, mm. yes or no, how bad it really is it? I mean, I try to live as gluten-free as possible. Me too. Yeah, that's by choice. I don't have celiac. You know, I know from experience when I eat something that's got gluten, I just don't feel the best. I feel like my knuckles get a little tighter. I wake up and I feel a little bit more puffy. Mm. Um, so by choice, I do that. It's also to me a low hanging fruit. You know, it's like it's not really impacting my quality of life to not have bread every day. And there isn't really any research that supports that like, gluten is doing us a lot of favors, right? It's really I feel like all the research is around like how much is it messing you up? Yeah. And that's the scale. There's nothing like you should have this is going to be because X, Y and yeah, Z. Exactly. Yeah. The only thing I would maybe say is like for vegan vegetarians, gluten being a protein could be a vegan vegetarian source, but there's also many others that could be choose or are chosen from. And so, yeah, like, you know, to me, it's like a no brainer. I don't need to be having those foods. I feel like oftentimes when it comes to gluten related foods, it's more of like a emotional desire rather than I'm gaining any nutritional benefit from it. And not to say that there's no you know reason to eat foods from an emotional standpoint but again like especially from my routine it's it's an intentional thing it's not an everyday thing because i don't i don't need it can i admit something i was quite embarrassed about recently mm. i for some reason i always thought oatmeal was had gluten. oats 
Ha, ha, ha. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> that was really embarrassing. Oh, too embarrassing. I always thought... Had gluten. I, by the way, oatmeal does have oats, guys. Um, yeah. I always thought that oatmeal had gluten in it. Um, so can I... I'll just... T- yeah. Before you share. Yeah. So for the last literally three years, I've been buying Bob's Mills yeah. gluten-free oats. Okay. Which are 30% more expensive uh. than Bob's Mills <laughs> regular oats. Yeah. yeah thinking yeah. like, well, I'm definitely... I'm like, I'm on the gluten-free bandwagon like 100%. <laughs> And then it wasn't until my fiance was like, Ed, you know that oh, it's there's no gluten free. There's no <laughs> gluten in oats. I'm like, of course there's gluten in oats. Why would they sell gluten free oats? And it was just basically when I researched it, mm. it was just that the facility mm. that they were packaging mm. didn't also contain gluten free. So I mean, if I had cl- if I could claw back all the money that I spent <laughs> on gluten free oats, I could buy a house. <laughs> Anyway, I just wanted to admit. I just yeah, wanted yeah. to admit that yeah. because I'm actually quite. I started. I was pissing myself, <laughs> laughing at myself, thinking about how much I'd spent yeah. on gluten free oats. But anyway, same that's way. hilarious. Although I will just, met, and it sounds like maybe you know this. Um, I, I do buy gluten free oats. Nice. The, <laughs> I do. <laughs> the reason being, oftentimes oats are manufactured in facilities that have wheat. Yeah. Yeah, that's which, what, that's exactly what yep, I was yep, yep. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. But I've never felt I've now moved to non gluten and don't foods, really feel the difference. Fine. Yeah. But I thought an interesting conversation mm-hmm. and that you shed some light on was the whole idea of where your gluten is sourced. So like culturally around the world mm-hmm. has a difference on how it how it manifests in the, in the body. So mm-hmm. I had just been to France this summer, mm-hmm. and you cannot eat, you cannot live in France if you're not having gluten. Yeah. Yeah, they have baguettes and bread for breakfast lunch and dinner mm-hmm. and at first i was kind of like oh, i don't know i would i would love to find an alternative mm-hmm. but after a day i was like no nah, there is none no nope. but i felt great mm-hmm. all holiday didn't have any issues didn't have any gut issues mm-hmm. felt energized joints mm-hmm. felt good mm-hmm. whereas i know you know one tenth of that amount here would have probably flared me up yep. i know there's lots of other things that could come into this i, I was on a holiday i was more relaxed mm-hmm. i wasn't stressed mm-hmm. immune system was probably heightened yep. could deal with it a lot more but you shared you shared some interesting information about you know europe especially all cultures a lot of cultures where gluten is a part of the diet mm-hmm. and how yeah please continue yeah yeah so um one of the reasons gluten can be a challenge is a lot to do with the agricultural processing of the wheat itself um especially in america if we're going to make comparisons uh, our agricultural process allows for the use of glyphosate which is a pesticide that's sprayed on wheat it's oftentimes also sprayed on corn and soy which is also why those two tend to be lumped into the triggering foods issues with the gut um, in European countries, glyphosate is actually banned, which is absolutely mind blowing. And so their wheat products don't contain this pesticide, which has been shown to through research to directly impact and deteriorate our gut lining. Um, and so that's why gluten from a sourcing standpoint or why gluten can cause an issue when it comes to leaky gut, but then from a sourcing standpoint, why you might be able to tolerate it well in a European country, but then you maybe come here to Hong Kong and food is imported potentially from America mm. and you have the issues here. So as a general rule of thumb, mm. sourcing your gluten containing foods mm. from European based countries could be a good thing. It could be a better thing better for thing. you. Correct. And also just going back to like you were on holiday and stuff like that, but maybe let's just talk about like the European culture in general. Um, you know, the way that they lead their life doesn't present them with as many assailants to their gut as potentially someplace mm. like America True. does, you know, True. they all, they also almost, unintentionally incorporate intermittent fasting because mm. a lot of them actually don't eat breakfast so they have yeah. big lunches and dinners mm-hmm. so they get these big periods of time where the digestive system is just At repairing rest. and healing yep. Um, yep. and i think that could definitely Huge. have yeah. a big impact on their ability to tolerate it uh, absolutely whereas like other you know western countries it's like grazing all throughout the day so that self kind of healing and cleaning process is always on the back burner never allowing it to repair and then you're also intaking foods that are constantly deteriorating. So it's kind of a, a double whammy there. Yeah, mm-hmm. I hadn't even thought about that. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's go to the next R. Sure. Replace. So we talked about remove first. So remove the foods and remove if there are 
you know certain things that are happening like inside we need to get rid of those mm. next thing is replace yeah so replace is replacing of our digestive juices uh those being bile hydrochloric acid and digestive enzymes all of the things that get released into our gut to better uh again treat metabolize digest absorb our food um replacing could be replacing through supplementation that's a direct like i'm taking actual hydrochloric acid i'm taking actual bile digestive enzymes um or you can also stimulate natural production through things like bitter tonics you can do bitter foods uh the bitter the bitterness the reason why bitterness is important is because when bitter taste hits our tongue it actually stimulates the vagus nerve which is our parasympathetic nervous system and when the parasympathetic nerve system comes online it triggers the release of these digestive juices so that's more of like an enhancement slash support to our already naturally occurring process rather than a complete trade or replacement does that make sense yeah i'm, I'm even thinking like I, would eating bitter foods in the evening time actually would that have any impact on sleep and like bringing us into more of a parasympathetic state in general? I've never heard that. Using bitter foods to stimulate the parasympathetic sympathetic nervous system to support sleep. And bitter foods is namely specifically for gut function. Gotcha. Yeah. So I wouldn't say like, oh, I'm going to take my digestive bitters and get a better night's yeah. sleep. Don't Not rub, necessarily. Don't rub bitter melon on your skin and hope you're going to have a better sleep. No. Okay, gotcha. Um, so yeah, replace would be replacing digestive juices, whether it be a supplemental form of it or an enhancement of our naturally occurring production through like herbals yeah. and bitter foods. So, so my, my opinion, listening to you talk about this was, I don't know why, but I had, even though it's so it makes total sense the mm. remove part mm. but i think so many people go to everything else so like the supplementation side of things yeah they're adding things in mm -hmm. and don't actually just remove the source of what's actually creating you know the issue in the first place so mm -hmm. i certainly know you know i supplemented with hcl mm -hmm. um digestive enzymes all sorts of that like lactase enzymes as well mm -hmm. but never actually went to the source of what the issue was yeah. so you're just kind of sticking a bandaid on on the issue and not actually addressing the issue, which is why I love the five hours framework. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Also, too, like what I say is we are supposed to be doing these things naturally if things are firing on all four cylinders. So like figuring out why are you not doing this appropriately mm -hmm. and getting to that? Um, because, yes, I mean, take away the barrier uh, to the function is, in my opinion, better than just being like, let's just slap a thing that just replaces it all together. I agree. Mm -hmm. Okay, next R, repair. Yeah, so that goes back to leaky gut repairing that gut lining um, through specific targeted foods. Bone broth is wonderful. Uh, mucoprotectants like slippery elm, um, licorice root. Uh, those are fabulous because what it does is creates a little mucus layer um, on the insides of your digestive tract just to provide a little bit of buffer while it does its kind of cleaning and healing process um and then there's also supplemental forms um l-glutamine at 200 2, milligrams a day fabulous because l-glutamine is a food for your enterocytes to do its uh healing process so i've been supplementing about 10 grams of glutamine a day mm -hmm. is that enough to and i, I basically was ha i have that in my post-workout water now so i don't have a shake mm. um but i always had the idea that a little bit of L-glutamine is better than none, mm. but it's it's minuscule relative to the quantity that you just said. Is is 10 grams of glutamine still going to be doing something? So I uh, I said 2,000 milligrams. Oh, milligrams. So 200 grams. Two grams. Two grams. Yeah. So two milligrams is two grams. Okay. So yeah. I'm having 10 2,000 milligrams. I'm sorry. Um, yes, but this is for gut repair. I mean, you're probably doing it from a muscular standpoint, which is completely... Well, I, I was actually doing from both. Oh, I was gut thinking, and... yeah, just keep, just give some goodness to my gut mm -hmm. as well as the muscle repair mm -hmm. side of things. Yeah. I don't think that that dosage is harmful by any means. And then for someone who is exercising as much as you do, you know, you would probably need a little bit more. Um, 10 grams of glutamine is not going to do harm to you. Cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We're mm -hmm. going to turn this into Ed's therapy session. Okay? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So we've got remove, we've got replace, we've got repair. Mm. Now we're going to re-inoculate. Yeah. Re-inoculate. Uh, pretty self-explanatory, uh, especially if you're going to go through a 
pathogenic eradication protocol, you want to make sure you're reseeding and feeding the good guys. Um, re-inoculate with prebiotic and probiotic foods, and then obviously with probiotic supplementation. Most people know about that. Um, pre, I guess we can talk about what prebiotic probiotic foods are. Probiotic foods being uh, your actual live gut bugs, and sources could be uh, kombucha, kefir, yogurt kimchi any fermented foods like you know sauerkraut fabulous thing to be incorporating into your day-to-day routine whether you have gut problems or not and then prebiotics i say that it's the food that your gut bugs eat in order to keep thriving and growing in quantity sources could be things that just think of um fermentable fiber sources fiber in general wonderful for feeding that gut microbiome so I've heard with probiotics, like mm. the strand plays a role. The strain, yeah. Right, the strain, thank you. Mm-hmm. How important is that? is that? Is that the level of detail that we need to be thinking about or even rotating your strains? Like, you know, should you be rotating between different probiotic su- supplements? Like, I, what, what are your thoughts on that? Um, so bifidobacterium and lactobacillus are the two biggest residents in our gut. And so if you have a wide diversity if you will because bifidobacterium and lactobacillus are like the top tier uh categories and you have a multitude of different bifidobacterium that was my justification for drinking yakult for 15 (laughs) years by the way it said lactobacillus on the on the out front i (laughs) I drank yakult as well (laughs) growing up it's very good um and so i would say if you have those two covered and you're at a cfu that's efficacious so like 50 billion Mm -hmm. would be awesome um then i'd say you probably are pretty good with that rotating probiotics you know i can't say that i've ever done that specifically either for myself or for my clients um i would say if anything i would change or what i would offer or suggest would be more of a probiotic by standard terms or a spore based probiotic do you know what that is no i don't Okay, so like probiotics are probiotic supplementation is transient, meaning you take it and then it kind of it goes out the other end. So that's why you got to take it every day. Spore based probiotics, though, what it is, is actually like to maybe give some imagery is seeds that are planted in your gut. They kind of take root and then they blossom. Oh. And so like spore based probiotics are for my clients that are like very very aggressive IBS related symptoms. Like we need to just like take that residence a little bit more aggressively to push out the bad, um, which is why the dosing protocol for spore based probiotics, like you have to be very careful of how much you do. Cause you don't want to be seeding multiple seeds and all of a sudden it's like, bam, and you get more bad than good when it comes to this. Those would be, I would say, instead of like doing any specific probiotic strain, those are the two that I maybe oscillate back and forth on depending on the case in front of me. Okay, so I think this is this was another mm. bit of a light bulb moment for me. Mm-hmm. Um, not so much in terms of my prescription to clients, but just like the, the language in the industry around or in health and wellness mm-hmm. around probiotics, which is like, you got a bad stomach, just take some probiotics, you'll yeah. be fine. Or yeah. well, probiotics is something that we should all be taking. Mm-hmm. But I think, again, like having the framework mm-hmm. to actually go to, you know, a probiotic is not the lowest hanging fruit. Mm-hmm. If, you, if you're if you recognizing you've got issues, there are things that you have to also do, you know, in conjunction or before, mm-hmm. you know, taking that probiotic pill if yeah. you want to make wholesale change. Totally. And it's like only one of the many things that should yeah. be looked at. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's move to the final which is rebalance rebalance yes uh what that means is rebalancing your central nervous system um instilling a stress management practice uh just because stress and what state your nervous system is in greatly dictates your ability to get your gut in order and maybe the reason why it went awry in the first place um our sympathetic or our central nervous system has two legs. There's the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. Sympathetic being your fight or flight. The parasympathetic being your rest and digest. Your body cannot function in both worlds. So if it's in one, the other is off. 
And so if you're constantly in sympathetic or fight or flight, that means your rest and digest is off, which means all of the functions of your digestive system is off, which is why, you know, I think going back to why is it that you're not creating digestive juices properly? Let's figure out that source. If you're in a sympathetic state, that's the reason why you're not excreting your digestive juices appropriately and why you might have to do a replace instead of a uh, instead of a coaxing of because you got to figure out what's going on with that sympathetic nervous system first and foremost. Yeah, I love that. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, for sure, every almost every time my digestive system is not functioning optimally, mm -hmm. again, just based on like a stool analysis and how I'm feeling, mm -hmm. it's almost always associated with a period of higher stress, yep. whether that's professionally or like it's athletically mm -hmm. and physically. Mm -hmm. um, those two always go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like I know when I'm moving into a, a phase of high, high stress, stress mm -hmm. I'm just kind of waiting. It's like a ticking time bomb mm -hmm. where I'm like, at some point, any of these days now, I'm going to probably start to see this, mm -hmm. you know, cross over into my digestive system. And as soon as that kind of happens, that's always like my big red flag where I'm like, okay, got to do something about this now. Absolutely. But you know, how, how important, like just how much does stress and, you know, living, I'm going to be away from saying living in a sympathetic state because I feel like it just doesn't resonate with people when mm -hmm. we say it like that, but just, you know, a high stressed individual. So it's like constant work stress, mm. not sleeping that much, long work hours potentially, even just like things like anxiety and mm -hmm. just heightened emotions all the time. Really like someone who struggles to be still mm -hmm. and be quiet. Mm -hmm. I think that's always a pretty good telltale sign that someone is probably living in more of a sympathetic state. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how impactful is that on the gut and everything we've been talking about? Greatly, 100%. Um, you know, there's like a, there's a bi-directional communication from brain to gut and gut to brain, which is why, you know, you feel you say or you hear someone is like, oh, I'm really stressed now. I have, a, I have a stomach issue or I have a stomach issue and now I feel more anxious. That's not by coincidence is because one definitely feeds into another. Now, what came first, the chicken or the egg, you don't know, which is the reason why with the 5R protocol, it addresses all both of those facets and why I mentioned like in the presentation, if you're working with someone that does not emphasize this, they are doing you a huge disservice because it is a huge factor into how well you're able to get your gut back in order and how you can maintain that thereafter. And so figuring out that stress response, you know, what is the source of that? And I had mentioned in the presentation when it comes to stress in your central nervous system, um, lifestyle is what gets you in or what got you in and lifestyle is what's going to get you out of that state. And so it's not at all a popping of the pill. It's figuring out with your day-to-day -day routine, what is that conversation that you're having in your head? What are you doing to take some time for yourself? What are you doing to slow yourself down? Albeit maybe some very difficult for some individuals, but 10, 15 minutes can do you a world of benefits, you know, that I'm sure some, most people can find some time to do. Yeah, I think we used the analogy <clears throat> earlier about the professional or the high level athlete mm -hmm. who has these periods of the year mm -hmm. where stress is higher because of competition and prep. Right. And then what has to go, what has to, the work you have to put in before that and after that yep. to basically mitigate the bad, <laughs> the, the more harmful effects of competition. Mm -hmm. I think it's exactly the same for everyday life, right? Yeah. So when you're going, because we can't avoid stress, stress mm -hmm. is going to be a part of life, whether it's controllable or uncon uncontrollable. Mm -hmm. So knowing that when you are in those periods of high stress, that's another, that's a time where you need to potentially step up yep. in all the other aspects of life. And this is an area that I now think about with my food, mm -hmm. which is if I am having a stressful day or a prolonged period of time, or even just a moment, like when I first started doing this podcast, mm. I would get like 45 minutes in like a knot in my stomach mm. where I'd feel like almost a crippling pain. Mm -hmm. where I'd be like keeled over a little bit and I'd be really uncomfortable for 15, 20 minutes after. And I knew it was because like I still wasn't comfortable mm. being on a mic and like I'd feel quite a lot of probably stress and anxiety mm -hmm. around doing a podcast. Mm -hmm. And so then I would recognize, okay, even if I didn't feel stressed in the moment, mm -hmm. my body's telling me mm -hmm. that that was harder than homeostasis. It was harder than normal. Yep. So then what do you do in that moment, mm -hmm. right? Okay, you've got all your, your lifestyle measures that we talk about all mm -hmm. the time, right? You know, like nature and breathing mm -hmm. and meditation mm -hmm. and journaling and gratitude and mm -hmm. 
getting outside and going for what all those things mm -hmm. but then even when it comes to food choices now mm -hmm. i'm i'm in a place where i'm thinking okay if this is what i'm experiencing right now mm -hmm. this high level of stress whether it's controllable or uncontrollable i'm not just going to put this is definitely not the time to just go to crap food yeah you know or like highly processed foods or high inflammatory foods this is the time where i need to go for maybe more easily digestible foods mm -hmm. uh be more diligent with my chewing mm -hmm um and go for like cleaner sources mm -hmm. would that be like the correct way of, of going about it yeah yeah like doubling down on of yeah 100 non-processed whole foods um doubling down on the gut supportive ones um and then i also do say like you know on an as needed basis pull the supplement lever mm. and get some support there as well you know like you mentioned digestive enzymes hcl times of heightened stress yes absolutely do take something that helps with supporting that leaky gut you know it's something that is an inevitability when stress is high so proactively mitigate that through some supplementation stress comes down pull those out these are all tools that's at our disposal so why not use it to better manage our modern day you know demands love it mm. I've got so many more epiphanies yeah. that just come to mind. One, one that just jumped into my mind was one of our coaches recently. Mm. He actually had a stomach issue. I don't know. We don't know what it was. He didn't go to the doctor, but he basically had the shits for three days. Mm -hmm. Couldn't hold anything down, but I think it was coming out of both ends as well. Mm -hmm. And so through this process, he lost a couple of kilograms mm -hmm. of weight. Mm -hmm. Most of that granted was probably water weight, but for him, he was going through a bit of a bulking phase where he was like, gutted that he'd lost two to three kilograms mm -hmm. in a few days so his response was to eat as much food as possible right which I, i've done that in the mm -hmm. past for sure so he was like smashing the subways ordering extra cookies mm -hmm. you know getting the the coca-colas down mm -hmm. smashing the gummies because he's like i need to get the weight back on but then thinking back into everything we just talked about yeah digestive system in a very compromised state mm -hmm. for whatever reason mm -hmm. and then I totally understand the idea behind what he was doing, mm -hmm. but you know, that's probably the worst time mm -hmm. to be just, you know, going through that process. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think that circles back to, um, you know, the longevity and health component of things, you know, that doing this more of a holistic trying to one doctor I absolutely love. His name is Peter Atia. Have you heard yeah, of him before? Legend. Yes. So like, how do you want to view your marginal decade, the last 10 years of your life and making choices now more towards that than maybe like, you know, the couple kilograms or so currently um, for the more short term benefit and gain? Yeah, we always think about, we talk about it here, which is like your lifespan versus your health span. Mm -hmm. It's like you can live to 100, but if your health span's only to 80 in your last 20 years. What's the point? What are, yeah, yeah. what are you doing? You know? Yeah, absolutely. Jamie, this has been awesome. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much, not just for this podcast, but for also your time and energy today coming mm -hmm. into Coastal, sharing all your knowledge and all your passion and all your <laughs> wisdom with all of us. Like I know we all had loads of light bulb moments going off and yeah. I've really, really enjoyed this conversation. So awesome. thank Happy you so to do much. It. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Where can people find out more about you, Jamie? Um, so my website's uh, jamiecampbellnutrition.com. And then for social, which is a full-time job, um, I'm only on Instagram, but it's, it's Jamie Campbell. And are you working with people remotely, people across the world? Can they, can mm -hmm. they work with you? Yes, absolutely. Um, I work, I have clients from all over the United States and as well in a couple other countries. Um, so yes, I can support people remotely if they're interested. So awesome. Jamie, mm -hmm. thank you so much for your time. Thank you.